When doing multi-threaded programming, there are a lot of tricks which can make your code more efficient with minimal effort. One of those tricks is a compare and swap loop. Ingenious in its simplicity. The logic of the CIS or CAS or whatever you want to pronounce it like is pretty straightforward. In a loop, atomically compare the value of a given variable with some expected one and change it to a new value if the comparison is true. If not, keep comparing but with the expected value changed to the current one of the variable. What does this give us in practice? When trying to set the value of a variable shared by multiple threads, the loop gives us the guarantee that the thread for which the comparison returns true is the last one which set the value, and without any need for blocking mutexes. This means that the thread running the loop doesn't need to wait for any lock on the variable to be released by any other thread. We call such situation lock-free. Multiple threads can access the variable, both reading and writing, without blocking each other. Now, let's get back to the video about object pools and try to make the pool of threads safe using a CAS loop. To fully understand this example, you should watch the pool video first. Okay, here we have our object pool code ready. It's taken from our last video. I just removed the timer because it's really not needed in this case. The first thing we need to make thread safe is the allocation method. Here we are modifying the value of next three here to point to the next element in the free list. This is a perfect place for a cast loop. We just need to keep trying to point to the next three element until we succeed or run out of elements. First, let's make our pointer atomic. This is a prerequisite for the whole algorithm. So our pointer is here, and we should change it to std atomic. Ah, oh, atomic. We also need to include atomic. And let's also include thread. Now let's get back to our allocate method. The first thing we need to do is, well, get rid of this old code. This check here can stay for now. And let's begin. First, assign the current value of our next free variable to a temporary one. So auto, let's call it item equals next free load. Now we need to create the cast loop itself. So let's start by writing a while loop. And inside, the first thing we need to check for is if item is a null pointer. If it is, then well, we already ran out of three elements, right? But if it's not, then we need to call our compare and exchange method from std atomic. So let's, so let's use end. Ah, sorry. Next three, compare exchange weak. The first argument is the value we are expecting next three to be at this moment. So it's our item. Why item? Because we loaded the value just before here. And the next argument is the actual value we want to store in next three if next three equals to item. Here we wish to store item next. So let's stop here for a second. First, why is this method called compare exchange weak? Well, because there is a compare exchange strong one. And the difference is that the weak version could be and usually is more efficient than the strong one, but can from time to time return false negatives. So even if next three equals item, our compare and exchange weak might return false, which need which means that the next three variable was not equal to item, which of course is not true. But since we are doing that in a loop, then it doesn't really matter for us. We'll simply iterate one more time. So if compare exchange weak returns false, and we know that next three is not item, it then atomically 
loads and stores the current value of next tree in the item variable itself. Therefore, on the next iteration, we will compare next tree to the last known value, which again is item. And again, we will try to assign item next to it. Note that the item variable in each iteration changes, which means item next also changes. And this is exactly what we want. We want to be the last thread to actually change next three to item next. And also, let's add some debug information. Usually here it's sufficient to add an empty statement, but we will add some pointing out. And let's use a string string for output. Why are you first printing to a string stream? Well, because here we will most likely have different threads trying to print to standard output. And by using string stream, we will print the whole debug information in one go. So the messages will not be interleaved. Okay, so that is our cast loop. Only a few lines of code. But we need to change one more thing. Here, we know that we exited the loop. And we can only exit the loop only if item equals null pointer. Or we successfully assigned item next to next three. So what we need to do here is check if the item is null. And if it is, we simply throw. Let's also add some debug information here. Okay, this looks quite different than the previous version, but it's not much more complicated. Let's move on to the second part, the deallocation. Here, the situation is similar. We want to change the next three pointer to point to our item being deallocated. We just need to keep trying until the CAS operation succeeds, meaning we are the thread which managed to change the value. We are assuming that only one thread at a time will try to deallocate the same item. If more than one tries to destroy an object, well, there's a deeper problem in the pool usage somewhere. So first, let's remove this line, but keep that one. And now, let's introduce another cast loop. So again, while not on next three, because next three is the thing we want to update. Again, compare exchange weak. We don't need a strong version since we are doing it in a very efficient loop. We want to assign item to the next three variable while assuming next three is equal to item next. So the expected value here is item next. The desired value is item itself. And again, we can end the loop with an empty statement, but let's add some debug info. And here it is in all its glory. And last, let's introduce two threads working on the same pool and see what happens. So in our main method, we simply create a lambda, consult all, let's call it foo, because why the hell not? Let's capture our pool. And inside our lambda, we will simply use the pool as intended. Ah, let's keep the countdown a bit. Okay, now time for our two threads to do some work. So std thread, t1 foo, t2 foo. Those two will begin using the pool immediately. And finally, let's join both of them. And there it is. We have two threads working on the same pool. Our pool simply changed its allocation method and deallocation method to a cast loop here and another cast loop here and let's run it. The logs are a bit unreadable but we can still see the two threads are using the pool in parallel, sometimes with success, sometimes with retries. Nevertheless, both have no problems with running smoothly without blocking each other. Things seem fine but cast loops have a few drawbacks and one of those drawbacks is quite serious. It's called the ABA problem. The essence of the cast is comparing the current value with an expected one. This can lead to a false positive when the variable being compared changes its value from a given one, but changes it back again between comparisons in the loop. The loop then thinks the value did not change while in fact it did. 
depending on the algorithm running, this can have more or less serious consequences. As for the other problems, they might be a bit more subtle. Some algorithms might seem to work while still having edge cases when they fail, especially when more than two threads start their work. Also might be, and historically have been, implementation bugs which can cause undefined behavior. And finally, the most undervalued problem of all, maintenance costs. Lock-free programming can be hard and sometimes it's just better to go with the good old lock, only for the sake of complexity and maintainability. As always, use the right tool for the job, not the most fancy one. But in our case here, you can see that everything boils down to two very simple loops which everyone I think can reason about. Things of course might get and will get more interesting and more problematic with increasingly complex algorithms, but here we have a nice example where things just work. Okay then, I hope this little example showed you how cast loops work, that they are not that scary as some might claim them to be. Hope you found it interesting, hope you found it informative. If you have any questions, post them below in the comments and I'll see you in the next one. Peace.